Thank you so much uh, for returning for our keynote address, the Bishop Lecture in Bioethics. So I actually have the great privilege of bringing up one of the Bishop family members, um, Dr. Andrew Bishop, to say a few words on behalf of the Bishop family. Thank you. Um, my teachers tell me that selfishness is the fundamental human flaw. Uh, I'm the one of my siblings who are here, Christine, raise your hands, Christine and David and Ellen, who didn't either study medicine or study uh, health care directly, or uh, including extended family, children, parents, aunts, uncles. So I'm, I was the plant scientist for 35 years who uh, now works for a health system at the end of my career. And every day driving up in my little gray Prius to park among the Teslas and Mercedes and Beamers, <laughs> I'm reminded of my dad riding off to work on his Raleigh three-speed. <laughs> so he could have had a Beamer. He could have had a Mercedes. But instead, we get this. <laughs> So uh, on behalf of my siblings and others in the family as well, I thank you for this forum, uh, which we enjoy to share uh, professional interests, during which almost annually now we indulge in our nostalgia for our youth in Ann Arbor. Uh, on behalf of my parents, I thank the speakers for their awesome effort to bring humanity and nuance to uh, this important research. And uh, thank Susan Gould and Reshma Jagsi for uh, putting it all together. I had, it was about 10 years ago that they died and I got acquainted with Susan Gould as we were setting up the funding to make this happen and really appreciate the sustained effort, pretty nice. Uh, and thank our speaker today for uh, coming all this way to share your work. So, thank you. I do remember that time about 10 years ago and saying, a what, a lectureship? <laughs> Who knew that when I met your father, I unfortunately never met your mother, that in the uh, ethics journal club I had started in a little back room of the hospital somewhere. Um, anyway, this has been a wonderful legacy of uh, Ronald and Nancy Bishop, both trained at the University of Michigan Medical School, graduated from there. And uh, Ron was obviously an esteemed member of our faculty for many years. and obviously interested not just in the science, but also in the art, the humanities, and especially the ethics of, of medicine and health. Um, the legacy of Ronald and Nancy Bishop, by the way, has been added to and shared by their children. And this is the eighth Bishop lecture, and we hope to continue ad infinitum long after I'm retired. So <laughs> I want to thank the entire family. And I have to say, too, that just getting to know all of you over the past nine or so years has been very rewarding for me personally and professionally. I always find interesting things to talk about, about plants, e economics, <laughs> hematology, pediatrics or marathons or cats even perhaps so <laughs> so those of you at dinner will know exactly what I'm talking about um, anyway thank you very much to the Bishop family uh, continuing the legacy of their uh, parents who had such an appreciation for ethics and justice I'm now delighted to introduce our Bishop lecturer this year Barbara Koenig is PhD she earned a PhD in medical anthropology, and I believe she had to kind of weave that medical anthropology together from two different units. Um, she's been a pioneer, really, in uh, empirical bioethics, that is not just philosophizing, but having philosoph philosophically well-grounded research about how 
stuff happens in the field of bioethics, and she has led three different uh, bioethics centers or programs in different places, and uh, has uh, she's been elected to be a fellow of the Hastings Center, which I'm sure many, if not all of you, have heard of. And importantly for the junior faculty, especially in the audience, she's been continuously funded by the NIH since 1991. And I can only say that in bioethics, that's probably a record. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, she has also done lots of consulting and work with policymakers. So she brings ethics into health policy making, for instance, uh, consulting for the CDC on their ethics committee and working with the state of California in issues related to big data, which I think we're going to hear a little bit about today, but also other things like, uh, oh, how do we implement this, you know, physician-assisted suicide law we just passed? <laughs> so so uh, Barbara brings a wealth of, I'm sorry, Dr. Koenig, brings a wealth of experience, insights, and is really a pioneer in our field, particularly in uh, bioethics and in bringing an empirical lens to that. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome her as our lecturer this year. Oh, I should tell you the title. <laughs> Does Enhancing Individual Choice and Control Promote Freedom? Challenges in Contemporary Bioethics. I do need some help with however the lights are going to go down in the front so that people can see the slides. And someone forgot their glasses, and it wasn't me. Oh, yeah, it was me. <laughs> okay. And you may definitely call me Barbara. Um, I'm from California, after all, so very... Um, that's, that's good. So, does enhancing individual choice and control promote freedom, a challenge to contemporary bioethics? First, I want to thank everyone for this wonderful invitation to come to Michigan. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great honor to be here and to do the Bishop Lecture. To answer the question, uh, so I'm going to give you the answer right now, and then I'll spend the rest of the talk uh, uh, sort of saying more about it. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit contrarian. Most of the talks that you heard this morning sort of started with the assumption that it's a good idea for people to have choice, that a lot of bioethics is about making choice more precise, about figuring out how to talk to patients about pr pr uh, procedures, et cetera, in neonatology, maybe how to choose a nursing home based on Yelp. Um, I'm going to say that perhaps we've done a little too much focus on cho choice and control and that we need to step back uh, at this point. Um, so I don't, um, I don't have any formal disclosures. I wanted to use a disclosure slide, though, for a slightly ironic reason, which is that you see my current NIH grants at the top and then my two sources of industry funding over my whole career at the bottom. I once took some travel friends from Illumina, which is the big sequencing company, um, and for a long time I served at the invitation of Paul Berg, one of uh, a Stanford Nobel laureates, so a very distinguished guy, on, a, on the Affymetrics Ethics Advisory Board. And I just want to say that the whole idea of doing these kinds of disclosures is transformed. This is a little bit about the issue of choice and control and the market, which is going to be the main topic of my, uh, of my, uh, that I'm going to address today. Um, and it's now become a bag, badge of honor to have more and more uh, intertwined uh, relationships with industry, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's an important thing. I'm particularly delighted to be able to honor uh, Nancy and Ronald Bishop. It was a great joy to meet the family last night. Um, and I think get, the sense that I got, I can imagine maybe I'm on the three-speed the three speed Raleigh bike, too. I had one of those when I was a kid. Um, and I'm going to be a bit of a, 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 a curmudgeon, and it sounds like some of, at least one of your parents may have had that kind of characteristic uh, as well. So let me give you an overview of what I'll do in, the, in about 50 minutes. I'm hoping to leave a good 25 minutes or so for discussion. Um, I'm going to highlight this, the, the study of market discourse and culture because I'm drawing a clear equal sign between this issue of the reification of choice and the market. I'm going to describe the distinction between brand as formulated in the world of business and reputation or integrity as a characteristic of a virtuous physician researcher. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically about my experience with that. 
Um, and then I'll discuss briefly the rhetoric of patient or consumer choice in two clinical domains. Um, precision genomics and big data as one, that's going to be the main case that I uh, work through. And then because care near the end of life is very dear to my heart, it's also very central to bioethics. I've been involved in that field since the very start. That's what got me into it. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll say just a little bit about that uh, as, as a case study. Um, so, as I said, from my point of view, this rhetoric of choice brings us, brings us in touch with what you might call a market logic. Um, I googled markets and I got immediately two sort of things, a sort of picture of a classic market and then a picture of a graph showing increasing market share in of various healthcare products, um, which suggests the problem of um, how, how the, this market-driven system uh, should should affect our field of bioethics. Um, there's also a backstory here. One of the things I'm starting to do is trying to wrestle with uh, a concern that I've had throughout my career that has been growing as I've moved from place to place. So Susan mentioned I started out at that other U of M, and as a matter of fact, I was very upset when I heard that you called it the U of M here. Um, <laughs> Uh, and at that point, there was very little discussion. I was a clinical nurse in pediatrics. There was not a lot of incursion from the market. I didn't see, uh, see that happening. Then I went to the University of California, San Francisco, and Berkeley to do my PhD. Um, and it was starting a little bit. I was there before the founding of Genentech, the very first biotech company. Um, and I remember, but there seemed to me there was a real distinction in the scientists, sort of the pre-Genentech and the post-Genentech, in terms of how they thought about scientific integrity. I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's just an important issue. Then I, I went down the, the road to Stanford and was the executive director of the Center for Biomedical Ethics, and that's where I started to develop some concerns. Um, and I remember being in a Department of Medicine faculty meeting and hearing and having the chair say, oh my God, how are we going to balance the budgets? We really need to figure out how we're going to do more uh, X kind of expensive chemotherapy or X kind of transplant services, to which my thought was, now wait a second, what about the medical students or the residents? Well, how are they going to learn the whole array if we sort of target what we're going to do and what we're going to do in our practice based on how much revenue it generates? So a real market concern. Uh, so that was something I was deeply concerned about. Um, for various reasons, uh, I, I moved at, uh, after 13 years at Stanford to the Mayo Clinic, uh, where I was the director of the program in professionalism and bioethics and really had the charge of starting the first bioethics program at Mayo, which was a, a huge challenge. Um, and there I found an irony, which I'm going to say more about, which is that Mayo is such an interesting phenomenon um, and it has a tie to, to Michigan, of course, because one of the Mayo brothers came to the University of Michigan to do medical school to get a legitimation early on. Um, but the Mayo, um, the, the brand was deeply prized. Uh, and we got lessons all the time about how to protect the Mayo brand. That was actually hard if you were in ethics because protecting the brand was not necessarily what you wanted to do. Actually challenging the brand and whether what we were doing lived up to the brand was what I thought my, my role should be, which sometimes caused a little bit of tension. Okay. Um, and now finally, um, uh, partly because my husband didn't want to be in the snow anymore, um, we, I, I've gone back to UCSF, which is where I started my career, and have yet another opportunity to start a bioethics program. Uh, and so... Um, we also have, a, a, so some of my current concerns will come up in the talk. But that's the sort of backstory. Um, I'm an anthropologist. This is a cover of a book, An Anthropologist on Mars, by Oliver Sacks. Um, but I've had the, I've been trying really to struggle with this issue of the incursion in the market and the market logic and the market, mar market language for a long time. Um, what is my perspective? I am an anthropologist. I like this picture because it makes you think that I actually dig up old bones under the hospital, which I don't. Um, <laughs> but I want to do one quote from Oliver Sacks. It's about the issue of what we see versus what we uh, can critique and understand. Uh, so this is from his book, An Anthropologist on Mars. And uh, I in initially started thinking about this when I, I, I actually did Grand Rounds once at Mayo, which I titled An Anthropologist on Planet Mayo. Um, OK. so. When we open our eyes each morning, it is upon a world, uh, 
it is a, excuse me, it is upon a world we have spent a lifetime learning to see. We are not given the world. We make our world through incessant experience, categorization, memory, and reconnection. Um, so this is very much in accord with the definition of the humanities that I'd like to give you. Now, I know I'm in a bioethics center that really has a strong social science component, but I want to say that one of the things that anthropology brings is that it's much closer to the humanities. It actually sits on the boundary of the science, the social sciences, and the humanities. So this is my favorite definition of the humanities. So much of our world is invisible, our ancestral origins, the foundations of our politics, our ideals of beauty and perfection, our moral architecture, and even the very notion of humanity cannot be seen with the naked eye. To the humanities are trusted the preservation, understanding, and communication of this hidden record of human experience and expression. So what I'm doing, the, so over the course of my career, I've been, I've been really um, very much perplexed by how to deal with this increasing incursion of market language and discourse in, uh, in biomedicine, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today how that goes into multiple domains of life. So I'm not trying to bash markets. Obviously, I, we have one of the, the, the bishop daughters is a health economist. Um, you know, one view of markets is that it's a neutral managerial tool uh, to manage social institutions efficiently. And it can sometimes do that. We're all happy with the world post-1989, for example. But there's a concern that the market focus on preference satisfaction leads to commoditization and all kinds of other uh, unfortunate trends. Um, markets are essential, but so we know that, and we also know that they don't work perfectly in medicine. The biggest way in which they don't work purpose, purpose, perfectly is that no one has access to good price information. Um, but, but that's not what I'm going to do today. I'm talking about the cultural dimensions of this market being in this increasing market discourse and talking about choice. And actually, the, the discussion about Yelp earlier was very relevant to this. OK, one, my Stanford colleague, Deborah Satz, wrote a book called Why Some Things Should Not Be For Sale. That's a more philosophic view of the, of the issue of the role of markets. Um, and I'm not going to say that you can throw all of the market elements, all of the c commercial elements out of medicine, because obviously in healthcare we can't do that. It's always been there to some extent. It's just the relative balance and how it changes what we do. Uh, but Deborah Satz wrote, um, markets, markets not only allocate resources among different uses and distribute income among different people, but particular markets also shape our politics and culture, even our identities. Some markets thwart desirable human capacities, some shape our preferences in problematic ways, and some support objectionable hierarchical relationships uh, between people. And she continues, markets may even undermine the conditions for a democratic society. So I think that's the, that's the biggest worry. Uh, and just to give you one example of the kind of language that I now see all the time that we just problematically take and listen to as though it's part of the water that we swim through as fish in the healthcare system, and that is this idea of the value proposition. Um, but when you look up the definition of that, you say in, in, in the, the first definition that comes up of, of the idea of a value proposition is an innovation, service, or feature intended to make a company or product attractive to customers. Okay, well, I don't think making a product attractive to customers should really be a foundational value uh, of our healthcare system. So I'm going to go out on a limb on that, which doesn't mean that you don't think about satisfaction, or, uh, but it, it's just not the only thing. Um, so back to my time at Mayo, our program in professionalism and bioethics had a mission and vision statement. Most people try and develop those, and I'm going to just articulate it a, a bit. And the mission was to promote the primary value through developing, articulating. Look, the primary value is the needs of the patient come first. If you've ever been at Mayo, you know that. It's absolutely the case. Even if you ask anyone, the parking lot attendant, the, the kitchen person, everyone can, can tell you what it is. And the mission is to promote the primary value through developing, articulating, and championing the highest standards of professionalism. Um, and the vision is that Mayo Clinic will be the leader in professionalism in medicine through practice, education, and research. Okay, that was good. This contrasts a great deal with the language of brand. Um, and it's a very different kind uh, of approach. So I found a lot of tension between those two things, between 
uh, between brand language and uh, professionalism language. So the, the, my conclusion is that there's a deep irony in building a brand based on, on Mayo Clinic's culture of professionalism. And brand, as viewed from the outside, might be unrelated to true virtue. Um, and I maintain that healthcare is fundamentally different than other service industries and even service brands. Um, so put that on the table. That's, uh, that's my view. We can come back to it in the discussion. Um, so how can we promote more core values? How can we avoid core values becoming mere slogans, reflecting brand discourse rather than intent in integrity and virtue? And I think one of the answers is we have to go back a little bit in our history to more focus on virtue ethics and more focus on professionalism, quite honestly. OK. Um, but now I'd like to talk a little bit more visually and graphically uh, about this water that we're all swimming in together with the increasing uh, market fo uh, forces. Um, I'm going to show you just a series of images of direct-to-consumer ads, uh, which are now so ubiquitous. I don't know if other people are. I find them annoying, so I like to collect them. Um, and I don't know if Michigan has any, but I'm just going to rush through quite a few of them so you can see them. Here's one from the... Um, the City of Hope, Make Miracles Happen, um, Disrupt What It Feels Like to Be in a Hospital. This is from one of my former institutions, Stanford Children's Hospital. Our Science Fights Cancer by Making Your Immune System Cancer's Worst Enemy. That's also City of Hope. A lot of these are, you know, the Sloan Kettering classic one that was up forever was, have cancer? Come here first. Um, uh, we're not just fighting cancer, we're outsmarting it. And just, this is like, this is now just constant. It's every day. We have them all over the buses that go, the shuttle buses that go from campus to campus. Think like cancer to beat cancer. This is Dana Farber. I just happen to have a set of cancer ones at the moment. Um, but it goes way beyond that. Then, So that's the ones that you see in ads. Now I'm showing you some ones that I get in my personal email constantly because I work on genomics. So for example, BGI, which is the big genomic sequencing group in China, this is, um, you know, almost every day, how many of you have this experience? Probably almost every day I get 25 or 30 direct-to-consumer, uh, direct-to, who knows, a scientist, they think that I'm going to buy something from them, um, ads, I'm going to do sequencing, whatever, I, and this is just an example. Here's one, BGI, we sequence, you discover, and they change them all the time. We sequence, you discover more. Um, quality data, fast turnaround, affordable. Um, here's another one that is that was from Minnesota Magazine in 2011. This is actually from Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic doctors performed a robotic, minimally invasive heart surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, this is particularly interesting because for decades, Mayo Clinic did not advertise. It was absolutely adamant about not advertising. Um, so this was a really a fundamental cultural change that happened within the, uh, within the organization. Oh, one other thing about Mayo that I should tell you that I meant to tell you on the slide when I gave you my little history. The other episode that happened while I was there that started to make me concerned about the, the, the market discourse uh, was, um, you know, so we hired a lot of people, really good marketing people who would write brochures, who would, you know, communicate things to patients. All of that was very good. And then uh, once, and then I was walking through the hall and I saw a big ad, uh, a, a, a Mayo employee essentially saying, I enrolled in a clinical trial and my life was saved, I was cured. Isn't that wonderful? Why don't you enroll in a clinical trial too? And I looked at that and I was shocked. I was totally shocked because the, of course, the marketing person had no supervision doing this and didn't understand that this is just not how you approach, um, you know, no, informing people about research. It was just, it almost seemed like it's an, it's, it was a consequence of a set of skills in the communication uh, being sort of misapplied in, the, in a one setting. Okay. Um, okay, so the next set, I'm just going to now show you, this is actually, some, this is the meeting that I went to last week. This was the last slide. I went to a meeting in San Diego called Frontier, Frontiers in Pediatric Genomic Medicine, and I went to that meeting because it's part of one of my uh, NIH grants that's about the question of should we sequence every uh, newborn at birth, which is a really interesting question, which has a lot of, uh, uh, which is very deeply entwined with the question of market forces. Um, so I just want to show you some of the things. And again, think of this. This is 
I'm the fish, I'm swimming through the water, do I see it, is it just part of the background now? Um, so this was, it was very beautiful, you could see we looked out at a tent, there were flowers, and there we have it, I think it was breakfast or lunch that was being provided by DNA Nexus, which is another one of the, the testing companies. Um, there were ads for everything, booths, places you could get little things to pick up as though it was commerce. Here was an, an, an ad about uh, finding a, a, a clinical trial recruitment process function. Here's one that, because it was about pediatrics, they had cute little baby boots you could buy, you could pick up and take home so you'd remember the name of their company. Um, uh, Alexion, which is an uh, artificial, in, uh, artificial intelligence, which was one of the big issues. So that was one of the, uh, the, they had a product. I actually confess, I have my Alexion water bottle up in my room right now in the hotel. Um, so it's hard to know whether you should take those things. Um, uh, and here's one for uh, something called Dragon Bio IT Platform. They were giving out beautiful T-shirts with dragons on them. Uh, and here's one that was giving out lollipops with and little uh, things, little uh, plush uh, double helix uh, things that you could have. This is uh, Carious. Okay, um, and then finally, I think this is the last one that I have. I want to point out another new way in which the commerce and technology is coming into things. A lot of the Bay Area um, companies and the biotech companies, and I'm not sure about Michigan and Boston, but uh, company leaderships are making decisions to give employees genetic testing as a perk uh, outside of their health insurance, but as a perk uh, as part of their employee benefits. And this is because they get directly lobbied by the other high-tech companies in the area who are trying to uh, influence this. It's a complicated issue. I actually have an NCI grant looking at some of these issues, um, and we can come back to it. But I think that this is a new kind of phenomenon of uh, which I haven't heard of before. Okay, uh, and then finally, this is the one I love. This I got. I actually got a direct to consumer ad uh, about a, a product to help me slice the spinal cord. How do I embed and cut great spinal cord slice? I wondered where that came from, but it actually was the case that I'd actually bought a mouse slicer, mouse brain slicer, about a decade ago when Mayo gave rewards to people who had grants, which is another market thing. That and I couldn't spend it because you had to spend it on equipment. So I actually bought a colleague a mouse brain slicer. So is it the case that somehow that resided in the sort of great memory? I don't know, but it may be. If, if it is, I'm deeply stressed, but OK. OK, so let me um, turn to the first. I'm going to use the two exemplars, the big data and the, and the end of life, more physician aid and dying uh, arena. Um, so. What I'm most interested here, the traditional bioethics concern, I'm going to talk about a range of concerns in big data research, but one is how to protect appropriately uh, research participants um, and where do choice and control um, fit in. And I'll, again, here I'll give you the punchline. In the current environment, it's almost impossible for anyone to do anything just based on individual choice. That is just not possible, other than just totally opt out. And even then, I don't think you really can if you get any kind of health care or if you're, if you're any kind, if you consume anything on the internet. Um, the, the way in which we usually offer people choice is through rituals of disclosure. So, um, and I was going to show you a whole long line of, um, of HIPAA disclosure forms and other kinds of terms and conditions of agreement. Some of you have probably already clicked through some today already on your phone if, as you move into a different network, et cetera. Um, so the, those kinds of disclosure forms are how we have originally empowered people's um, choice, even though it's not very effective, I would argue. Um, so privacy and control have been, the, have been the main focus in that the control piece is a part of the freedom in my original title. Um, so the individual is the focus. The individual maintains control while alive in these databases. There's an assumption of confidentiality in the clinic. The common rule emphasizes protection of con confidentiality for research participants before death, and HIPAA continues protection after death. So that's the sort of current regulatory framework. 
But one of the problems is that privacy as a concept is deeply political. Um, it's not simply a neutral, instrumental way of having your interests protected. It's much more difficult. And most people, some people want um, privacy for much more fundamental reasons, um, having to do with the balance between freedom and, and, uh, and control. But I would say that there's a fun another fundamental irony is that progress in precision medicine requires individuals to sacrifice control. So if we're going to actually get enough databases set up to really look at these complicated associations between genes, environment, and disease in a longitudinal way with large enough samples, it's going to be almost impossible for people to exercise control. And if a lot of people opt out, then we're going to not have particularly good databases. I'll elaborate on some of those, uh, those issues. Um, there's, um, there are a lot of limitations with the current HIPAA privacy rule in the United States. The process of legislation was a compromise, balancing interests of multiple groups. The main focus was uh, security of electronic data transfer, uh, provides few true protections beyond disclosure and notification. I think that's an important thing. This doesn't, HIPAA doesn't actually protect you very much. It more just engages in these rituals of disclosure and notification. Also, it doesn't apply to everyone. So a lot of the individual uh, actors who have that data, maybe that company that sold mice, you know, mice brain slicers wasn't a covered entity. Um, what about de-identification? That's been the other, that's the other approach that most people have taken to the idea of how we can protect uh, re uh, research participants in big data collections. Um, it's, it's, the, it's one of the primary approaches often it's a bit of a legal um, uh, loophole. Um, and my colleague, Michael Burgess, who's in the back, said to me uh, recently when we were talking about this, it might be legal to, dis to share uh, de-identified data broadly, but we really don't have a social warrant to do it or an ethical warrant to do it. Um, it's legal, but, it, but we don't really know if we should be doing that. Um, so. Also, the, the current terms and conditions of service agreement, we call them tacos agreement in California, just to be cute, um, they're obtuse and they're extremely confusing. But that's the grounds under which everyone who goes into a hospital signs one of these terms and conditions, and that basically says, we're going to share your de-identified data. Now, there might be local state laws that apply, but that's definitely the case in California, and we keep getting in trouble about that, actually, also. Um, there are limitations of the existing regulations and the model of, of balancing risk versus benefit that they're based on. Um, so, uh, and Kieran O'Doherty, who's in the uh, audience also, we're going to be meeting tomorrow about some, uh, something I'll talk about later. So he's particularly has written some really wonderful papers on the fact that future risks are ill-defined and may simply be unknowable, and they may not be in the bio biomedical realm. So some risks of being part of these databases uh, may be so uh, hard to pr predict or even imagine. Um, and they, they pr these risks it presents an additional challenge to reliance on patient authorization or research participant consent after balancing risk-benefit ratio. So that's been the way that IRBs have always done this, balancing the risk-benefit ratio. But how do you do that if you really don't know what the risks are? Um, so that means that this choice, the idea that choice is the key, doesn't work. Um, one approach that has, been appro that has been applied is to, let's figure out how to just get great computer programs and every patient can then follow all their data through all these systems and make decisions every day about which researcher is going to use their uh, da data and how much security they want around it. There's a company called Private Access that works with the uh, Genetic Alliance, which is an, organ an advocacy group uh, of a lot of genetic disease interest groups. Uh, and they've created something called Peer or the Platform for Engaging Everyone Responsibly. And I will admit that this is a, an interesting approach, and it has a sort of techie appeal to it, that we just give everybody control. Um, but I'm just not sure if, it's, if everyone is going to want to spend all of their time responding to emails about, could you be in this epi study? Could you be in this uh, other study, this longitudinal study? And I think it's just by definition we're going to get 
lower and lower participation, which has huge problems associated with it, because I really do want to answer the question of precision medicine. I really want that answer. I don't want to just have the, the human participation issue sort of swamp it. Uh, another solution, and this is a solution from George Church at Harvard, who's always, he's very, very much an interesting iconoclast. I really like him a lot. Um, and that is to allow individuals to have full control by selling their data and in, in, in information from the associated genomic samples using secure anonymous approaches such as the block, and that's a Bitcoin image, such as the blockchain with payment via Bitcoin. Okay, so that's a really extreme solution that puts this right in the heart of the market, okay? Just let the people whose data are being used become a market contributor like everybody else. Why not? And then we'll just go purely in that direction. Okay, where is it, you know, give up on altruism, I guess. Okay. Um, the other problem is just the rapidly changing environment in which we're living, and we've all lived through, and I don't, almost don't need to say this this month, given what we've just gone through with Facebook, but a lot of us have talked about the sort of first Facebook crisis, the first experiment, which was the experiment in 2014, when Facebook conducted a massive psychological experiment on a huge number of users and actually manipulated their news feeds um, uh, to, to actually see what the effects would be on their emotions. And the details of the experiment, and this is a great case to use in teaching responsible conduct of research, for example. Uh, the details of the experiment were published in an article entitled Experimental Evidence of Massive Scale Emotional Contagion Through Social Networks. And it was actually in the PNAS, so it was in a good uh, uh, place. That led to a lot of concern about what really was happening with social media in terms of use of data, uh, which I think is important for us to keep in mind. And again, we don't have a lot of choice in how that is used. We haven't. Um, can you see that's Mark Zuckerberg? Um, so the second crisis is the Cambridge Analytica crisis. Um, there he is testifying before Congress, um, which raises, I think, the big question for me is who is trustworthy in this environment? Who is trustworthy for us to share our data with? And I'm going to say a few more things about that. Okay, so what are the broad consequences of data and analysis practices? To what extent is a research pro project focused on enhancing the public good or the underserved of society? Um, speaking last night with one of the, uh, uh, the bishop's son, um, I guess I, I recently published an article called 10 Simple Rules for Big Data. This is one of the rules um, that you need to think about to what extent is a public project focused on enhancing the public good or the underserved of society? Are questions about equity or promoting other public values being addressed? Or is a big data focus rendering them invisible or irrelevant to your analysis? So I want the researchers be, to be, I don't want, so here's a good example of the kind of trade-off I'm interested in. I want the researchers to be thinking about these things and asking these questions. I don't want the participants to be sitting there exercising choice. So that, uh, just again, to, to make the distinction that I'm trying to make. Um, and we've already talked about the fact that downstream harms really um, often are very hard to predict. One thing that did come out recently in this last month of revelations is the estimates are that 126 million Americans were exposed to fake news feeds generated by Russian agents in 2015-16. So that's really pretty frightening and, and, and disturbing. Um, I said, I, I, uh, we recently had this episode in, in last week, which was the big headlines in California about uh, finding a, a, kill, a, a serial killer using a match with a public uh, DNA upload program called GED Match. So what I have up there, you won't be able to read it. I just wanted to, this actually was what the company um, actually posted to justify the use. And it said, oh yeah, you're concerned, but everybody who was in our database has seen this disclosure, which essentially said, um, let's see, it has always been GED Match's policy to inform users that the database could be used for other uses, as set forth in the site policy. And so then they give the link. And this was actually widely understood. Now, whether you think that finding a serial killer is a good thing or a bad thing, I mean, obviously, in this case, it looks like they really, uh, that this was an interesting uh, uh, example of a use of public DNA uh, databases. 
Um, but you can imagine other kinds of political uses of data like this that you would be concerned about. So uh, again, it's unclear how the choice, how they're reading those disclosure documents, how whether you did or not, you just click, you think it's fun, um, et cetera. Okay. Um, there's another justice issue in big data that can't be addressed through individual choice, and that's the issue of whose data get into the research com commons. And I think many of us in the field are deeply concerned that there are systematic biases in that and, and that genomic data are particularly skew, uh, skewed for various reasons. I'm just going to show you one big bit of data about that. And this is an, uh, uh, from a, a study in Nature by my colleague Malia Fullerton uh, at University of Washington, which shows, compares 2009 and 2016 about what, how much of the existing genomic databases that we were using as the baseline and to interrogate other samples with came from uh, individuals of European ancestry as opposed to individuals of other ancestry. And you'll see that it's gotten a little better, but it's still primarily white European, which really has huge problems for interpretation. And it has huge problems if, if justice is one of your concerns in how we uh, move forward in genomic medicine. Okay. Um, there also are some interesting conceptual challenges in, in big data that result for in because of the use of machine learning, artificial intelligence and the move toward algorithm-based practices in medicine. So I think these are the new outcomes of precision, of um, big data research. And sh will algorithms actually replace clinicians? When should they? Uh, and so there are some interesting questions that arise that, again, are not going to be dealt with by uh, individual choice or control of samples. Um, so I just want to go through them really quickly. Um, so one is that algorithms often mirror human biases in decision making. And that's a sort of foundational problem in big data, that you do the algorithms based on the, addition, uh, the existing data, and that reflects the biases of that. So machine learning, for example, absorbs problematic social bi biases, and the best example of this is that in the legal realm, programs that have been designed to help judges sentence offenders have shown an unnerving, quote, this is from a paper, an unnerving propensity for racial discrimination. Um, again, and this, uh, and there was just a great article in the New England Journal by my Stanford colleague, uh, Danton Char and David Magnus. Um, so programs based on data may yield uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy, and this is something that's really interesting. So the example is, if you believe that a particular presentation is universally fatal, and you program that into the algorithms, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And this is a real issue right now in pediatric genomic medicine, where we're really struggling with the issue of how we, um, when we use a genetic diagnosis found through sequencing to help or hinder a referral to palliative care. So this is a big real life issue right now. Okay. Um, and then the second bullet, the nature of medical knowledge, including what is expertise, also is likely to shift. Um, and uh, those of us in ethics are interested in whether machine learning tools actually reflect professional ethics. You know, do we build the ethics into the way we do that or do, do we have some other goals? For example, you could create algorithms, market-based algorithms that might be applied, that might be set up so that you can generate the maximum profit from your patients coming through your system. So, um, so there have to be there has to be a lot of discussion and reflection as we're thinking about these issues. Um, so, I'm, this is uh, uh, Chamath, and if, if we have anyone from Sri Lanka in the audience, they can possibly uh, uh, help uh, in. How many of you know who this is? Oh, good. That's good. No one does. You really should follow him online, and you should look at some of his most recent uh, online interviews. He was one of the early found. He was a, one of the early employees at Facebook. Helped create a lot of their products. He's now out of the company for about five years. He also owns the Golden State Warriors. So for people in San Francisco, that's as big a deal as your football team here. Um, <laughs> And he, he's an amazing person. Um, so, and this is what he has been saying now. He's deeply concerned, and I think I share some of the concerns. Um, people believe that what is popular 
what is liked is what is truthful. So he's actually <laughs> hypothesizing a completely different way that we're coming to understand what is truth and how that can be manipulated. And he's very open about it. And that's one of the big problems of the internet right now. It's one of the big problems about relying on choice. OK. And he basically makes the point, you can amplify any message with money. Um, and he's talking about the tools he developed. Our tools erode the social fabric is something that he recent, recently noted, which I think is, is pro probably pretty close to the truth. Um, so do follow him. He's an interesting person to read. Um, he, he did a talk for the Stanford Graduate School of Business, which is all available online, so you could read that. Um, the other thing that we've recently learned from a, a very good paper in science is that false news, news spreads faster than the truth. So how does that mean? You know, so all the people who are proposing that we manage all these big data by creating internet platforms for people to control their data with are sort of forgetting the fact that the very platform itself seems to be sort of compromised and, and subject to this kind of manipulation. Um, and so I'm, d that's, I'm deeply worried about that. Okay. So here are the questions that I'm dealing with um, uh, at, at my own institution. So under what circumstances, if any, should a public university health system share data with commercial entities such as Facebook, Google, and Apple? Now, you may want to know why in the world would anyone want to do that. Um, well, the reason that people want to do it is because if you are a big data believer and a precision medicine believer, it's now at the point that the data sets are so huge, the technological <laughs> capacity needs is, is so sophisticated that we can't do it anymore in the academic medical center. Uh, or that's the justification. So that's one reason. So I've been involved. Um, Susan was talking about the ways in which I've been involved in policy. This later in the week, um, you, the Office of the President is going to release a report that I was part of writing last summer that's trying to establish principles to govern when a public university should share data with a for-profit uh, company. So that's um, something that I'm working on, and we did an op-ed about it, too. It's a really hard question, and I don't have an easy answer, um, because probably we're not going to be able to make use of these tools if we don't share, but what should be the conditions? What should be public governance of such things? So that's what we're thinking about. Whoops, did I just... Okay, so I think... Okay, and another question is, these are the questions that I fret about. How would you approach a research project? So say you set up that big data collaboration. How would you approach a research project that sought to link data about educational attainment with genomic markers and or brain images documenting frontal lobe volume? And you'll see I've cleverly put a eugenics medal from a, fa a fa family fitter fit contest in the 20s uh, up on the other side to give you a little hint of what the concern might be. Um, so that's really, those are the other kinds of questions and concerns if we're going to go back to using some of this research, these data for really problematic purposes uh, that, are, um, that can be a, a problem. Okay, so what is the significance of the new digital economy? I'm not, that's not my main focus of, of, of analysis right now. But when I was preparing this talk, and as I'm thinking, because you can see what I'm probably moving toward is writing a little a book about the market issues. And probably each one of these points that I'm sort of glossing over will be a whole chapter. But um, I came upon something that I hadn't read a lot about before, but the idea that what we're, the regime that we're currently within is something called surveillance capitalism. And this idea that we have a whole capitalist enterprise built on data that is monetized from individuals who voluntarily give it uh, and allow that to happen. And there are positive things from this, but there also are uh, possibly concerns about it. I should say that I'm a little conservative. Maybe it's just because I'm old enough to have actually typed papers on a typewriter. Um, and sometimes people call me, you know, sometimes I have to call myself a digital dinosaur. But, um, but I think this, this is such a foundational transformation in how we, we use data and think about knowledge that I think we have to take account of it. OK, so let's move away from big data. I'm going to take a, a shorter amount of time uh, to talk about the sort of end-of-life care arena and the physician aid in dying. Some of you may know that um, California passed uh, uh, about a year and a half ago uh, one of the 
we were like maybe fourth or fifth in passing uh, a physician-assisted suicide, depending upon your politics, or physician aid in dying if you're on the other side, because the language we use is important. Um, and so I was involved in convening stakeholders from around the state to try and think about that. So it, um, it struck me that this is another area where the issue of choice has been also of deep, deep import, the issue of choice about what kind of end-of-life care. And it seems the most intuitive. We want to give people a lot of choice. Okay. But I just want to point out that I've done several decades of research on things like advanced directives, and it always seemed to me that the focus on choice was a little bit misguided. We started, then we started learning some of that in terms of the behavioral economics and psychologists who started to, to actually study and understand that sometimes giving people a lot of choices is not a good thing. Um, and uh, this is a sort of classic book by Barry, Barry Schwartz that uh, deals with those issues. Um, for example, uh, the original advance directive and other movement, which was to essentially, some of you may remember, it said, do you want X? Do you want Y? Do you want Z? Do you want uh, A, B, C under these circumstances? And it was like, ah. Um, and then plus, they often weren't even uh, uh, observed in, in practice when the time came. And how in the world did most people, could most people make that kind of very specific decision uh, when it was a once in a lifetime decision? Uh, um, phenomenon that they were experiencing, and how much of it was really about choice and how much of it was really about care and how to get people into the right systems of care. So I did, um, if anyone's interested, I can send you some papers. I basically made the argument that we'd set up a system where people had to embrace and choose their dying in order to get into a good system of care like a good hospice. And I was, uh, I was concerned that that wasn't the best kind of social practice, and maybe we needed a little best a little bit less choice and more really good nursing homes and hospices <laughs> that people could go in by default, because sometimes defaults are good. Um, so that may be an extreme condition. It's especially important in the end of life arena, because in some cases we really are functioning almost uh, as merchants of immortality. You know, we're asking people about, and now incredibly, we were talking also last night at dinner about the new cancer immunotherapy drugs and how that's transforming some of the dis discussions about transitions to palliative care, so uh, very important. Um, another way in which this choice architecture seems to be built in is that it's becoming part of slogans from professional associations. So I, I don't want to criticize. Um, I very much like the people who did this initiative, which is really about helping patients to choose better. Um, but Sometimes that the, I think the focus is a little bit too much on getting them to choose as opposed to recommending things that make sense and that might have a general, um, you know, because the first one of these essentially says, this is the a ABIM, um, you know, let's help make sure that patients choose things that have actually, are actually scientifically vetted and work. Okay, but since when did that become the patient's job? Um, you know, to choose those things, as opposed to our job to, to give them to them, sorry. Um, an, another really interesting phenomenon, this gets back to the issue of professionalism and its relationship to choice. There's a current key uh, lawsuit um, in my neck of the woods. Sutter Health is a big system in California, and a neurologist at Sutter Health um, has actually, is actually in a lawsuit about the issue of what she can disclose to patients about their prognosis, et cetera. So this is a big, a big issue. Um, and so, and the, 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 let me just read it so I get it right. Sutter Health, she claims that Sutter Health violated a California law and public policy that states a physician and surgeon is encouraged to advocate for medically appropriate care and no person shall terminate, retaliate, retaliate against, or otherwise penalize a physician and surgeon for that advocacy. So she really feels she thought she was advocating in her patient's best interest and that she was fired because of that. So this is another element of physician virtue that we're going to have to be dealing with, which is the issue of uh, how are physicians going to deal with these, these issues when they're, what they're allowed to talk about with their uh, patient becomes compromised. Uh-oh. This is telling me that we need another power source. So... Oh, you're working on it. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. And now I, I want to have one other, um, just tell you a bit of, uh, I said this is partly a personal journey. 
of thinking about all these market and other forces in the way that we understand our world currently. Um, and so uh, I had rotator cuff surgery in December. I had a whole bunch of yucky calcium deposits in my various supraspinatus and different uh, tendons and a couple tears. And so it's a brutal surgery. So I actually learned a lot about uh, shared decision making because I swear they didn't tell me that it was going to be so difficult. But then on top, <laughs> on top of everything else, um, uh, they then asked me with a long document, you know, to consent to get to be part of something called Health Loop. And it's really sort of my digital do doctor. And so you can see, here's an example of one of the messages. They started sending these to me almost every day once I agreed to be part of this. <clears throat> and I actually found it really disturbing. For one thing, it was my right hand. I couldn't type. I couldn't use the computer. <laughs> this was the way that they were, they were communicating with me, and I found it really confusing and, and concerning. Um, that's, the, that's the website. They call it an automated patient engagement solution. I'm not sure what the problem was that they were having a solution for um, because it was often information that was in, con it was in congruous, it was, it was in conflict with the other information I was getting. So, so very, uh, very confusing. Okay, I can't, I don't, I don't want to do this talk without talking, without saying something positive about uh, the whole, about consent and authorization, because that's usually a main criticism I'll get. I'm arguing now like a philosopher, what's the counter-argument? The counter-argument is that it's a really good idea for people to be in control of what they're doing because that's an important value. Uh, it's a value because it makes acts that wouldn't be allowable otherwise, like that surgeon putting those four big things in my shoulder. If I hadn't given him the consent, that would have not been a good thing. Um, so, so it's not that I'm opposed to it. I've just argued in some of my recent work that consent has become the modern equivalent of a fetish. That we that it's not that it's no longer meaningful that it's become um, almost like a, a, a ritual that may have important mean important uh, components associated with it, um, but I think it's different in different domains, um, and we know also from lots of decades of empirical studies uh, that it's not uh, that it's not foolproof. Okay, I want to say one a few things about um, deliberative community engagement because I th see that as one of the things that might actually be a useful counter narrative to what we're talking about, which is that instead of having individuals all consent by themselves or give authorization or have control over their data, we might be able to find a way of getting the patient voice in an authentic way or the public voice into how we do our science policy. Maybe move past the limits of individual informed consent as the sole strategy, to get people in the public together to debate and discuss trade-offs, set meaningful defaults in the policy arena, and address broad public concerns, such as eugenics, privacy, and uh, research benefit. Uh, so that's the hope. We're having a meeting all day tomorrow to talk about that, so it'll be fun. The arguments in favor of this kind of a model, which allows you to have a different kind of governance, is that the, the, what's happening now in our world is really reflects a democrat, democratic deficit in that um, only people, only the Facebooks really are able to get their word out there before Congress. The average person whose data is going to be harvested and used is not really part of the discussion. So we need to, it's incumbent on us to figure out a way of doing that. Those of you in Michigan, you're, you have such strong deliberative theorists and, and practitioners here in your department that you probably all know about this, but the idea that you convene small groups of stakeholders or many publics, they learn about a topic that's really difficult and complicated, then they deliber deliberate about it and, and come up with a report. It's much more complicated than that, but that's um, uh, a little graphic. Um, it's been studied and evaluated. It, uh, there are some challenges, which I'll say something more about. But again, the goal is, is not to inform. So this isn't just education. It's, it, it's not education, it's, although we do educate. And it seeks genuine discussion among representative community members and makes recommendations about implementation, governance, and long-term community oversight. So that is really, um, that's really the goal. Hard to do. Um, the key conditions are that it takes a lot of time um, and, and you you have to assemble a lot of information and you have to have an atmosphere of mutual respect. 
Here is just a picture of a deliberation that we did in uh, previous that I was involved with, just to give you a sense of people. Large group, a uh, group of about 25 or 30 people gathered around the table. Also, small group, pe small groups of people making having discussions in more intense ways. Uh, the experts who are experts in the field, like someone who was an expert in big data, this is Zuckerberg before Congress in a way, but in this case, the experts are the servants of the deliberants. They're not driving the debate. They're not allowed to, uh, to, uh, to be part of the deliberation. Um, the other really important thing to keep in mind is that the deliberation aspect can be especially good to because it helps establish the limits and the usefulness of consent and authorization mechanisms. And so I would argue that the most important critical feature of the upfront informed consent process is really to find a way of engaging with people and having them give you authentic consent to be governed by a particular regime of research. So for example, those people, I showed you the list before of you know, would, being concerned about social justice, being concerned that the database doesn't get corrupted because it doesn't have enough uh, uh, individuals of other ancestry, for example. So, uh, but all those terms can be spelled, in the, spelled out in the original agreement. Uh, and, and also, deliberants can recommend mechanisms for ongoing community oversight. We've just done that, we've done that several times at Mayo um, and in other parts of the world as well. Um, and governance approaches can be uh, adaptive, which is, um, a, there's a great paper by Kieran O'Doherty who's in the audience about that concept, meaning that it's not like a static contract, like in a, a clinical trial, but it can adapt over time. Um, I don't want to say, okay, so, but I don't want to say that now we have sort of this magic consent and now we're going to have this magic community engagement and it'll be like a Star Trek decoder and you can figure out exactly what people want and go to a solution. I don't think it's quite that easy. Um, there's still a lot of challenges. The regulatory framework is not really, in spite of what we just heard about emergency research, the community-focused approaches are really not uh, very uh, easy to implement. Um, the focus remains on individual choice and individual uh, based, you know, it's the classic tenet of liberal individualism. Um, deliberative engagement also is expensive and time consuming. Um, and techniques of evaluation, how do you really know when you succeeded, are, are, are challenging. And I also want to raise a cautionary note. So many of us, and I'll say more about this in the, uh, tomorrow when we meet, I think there may be some issues about deliberation in the United States, at least in a post-Trump environment, um, that we need to consider. And we recently did um, three community engagements on a project called Building the Medical Information Commons. And it was indeed on this topic, this big data project of how do you create databases uh, um, that include biological and genomic data that are longitudinal, that let you look to, at the electronic health record, et cetera, how do you build those kinds of, um, uh, uh, of projects around the country? And we did three public engagements in three different parts of the United States in order to try and answer that question and get guidance from the public. And we get, did get some interesting guidance, but we also learned a lot around the edges, unfortunately. And what we learned was that there, um, and this hadn't happened before, so in the past when we've done this, when we did this in the upper Midwest, in Minnesota, people were just delighted to be part of it. They were honored to be, they were, they, uh, were thrilled. They thought it was a great idea. Uh, and they sort of bought the Kool-Aid about let's get everybody together in a room and make recommendations. That did not happen now post the, in the post-Trump era. And I think there must be a connection. Um, people were concerned. They were suspicious. In a couple cases, they just didn't, they kept saying, well, you say that that's what you're doing, but what are you really doing? It's almost like they were uh, reading the, the, the Facebook guy, um, and maybe they were, and that was why they were concerned. Maybe they were right to be concerned. Um, so at any rate, uh, it's, it's not a panacea. It's not a Star Trek decoder. Um, so here, I'm on my last couple slides. Yeah, so... Does choice and control promote freedom? Okay, so first, in the big data arena, I'll try and summarize quickly. Allowing granular control or actual data sales cannot protect, in protect individuals from unknown future harms, nor can it solve the deep social justice concerns at the heart of big data. So I think having more freedom is not going to help. 
Um, in the physician aid in dying um, arena, which I've thought about a lot, choice will not have an impact on the big issues in care, um, which is really access to really good, high-quality nursing care and other care at the end of life. Those are the real issues. Um, and I also wanted to just make, this is a, I'm now going to channel Dan Callahan a little bit, who was one of my mentors. Um, you know, who, this is a, a practice that very few people want to exercise. It's like the epitome of choice. You have complete choice over when you're going to die, how you're going to die. Um, but what has been shown so far by the empirical studies is that that choice is most relevant to those who live their lives in relation to a narrative of control, and that that's a small number of people. So there are a small number of people who want to live their life that way, and we've now opened up this whole thing, which takes a huge amount of resources and effort uh, for that small people who, who value freedom more than anything. Um, and that's, that is okay, um, but I think we need to understand it and uh, take account of it. Um, and then finally, I think choice can be a prop, it can be problematic for clinicians who becomes simply the, the purveyor of goods in a market? And I think that's what's happening. And I have one quote from a really spectacular uh, physician writer who some of you may know named Victoria Sweet, who's in my uh, part of the woods. And she has a new book called Slow Medicine. Um, and just a couple quotes that sort of highlight this concern about what's going to happen with doctors. She said, first, she starts out by saying, shared decision-making is a fantasy of the healthy, which I think I, uh, I uh, agree with. Um, but then, more importantly, algorithms, regulations, requirements, and mandates, they lift that mantle of responsibility off the doctor and turn him into a provider, a middleman, someone who takes the box of healthcare off the truck and delivers it. <laughs> She's very forceful. So, are these issues new? Um, no, probably not. I want to just call your attention to another. Uh, this has been a great, this has been really fun preparing for this talk because I've done some new reading. Um, so this is, I'm going to call your attention to an article from the New Yorker in 2012. And, and it's about the whole beginning of marketing and political consulting and manipulation. Um, and prior to Obamacare, the founders of modern political consulting defeated government-sponsored health care in the U.S., proposed by Earl Warren in California and then Harry Truman nationally by using aggressive business marketing techniques. And they were really the people who pioneered this. And it was Leona Baxter and Clem Whitaker. And they really started the whole, this whole public relations kind of field. And if you look at what they did, it's... It's, a, um, it's by Jill Lepore, who's a great historian at Harvard. And she then details how they actually got them, how they changed people, how they got them to vote against their interest. And it's very relevant for today, so I urge you to do that. But it also suggests how, um, how the, the kind of market manipulation of information is something that we just have to always be attentive to in a, in a democracy. So, conclusion, what should be the role of bioethics? And I am worried about this all the time. I, uh, the, the role of, goal, of bioethics, in my view, is to open up a moral space for reflection and debate while taking account, while taking seriously account of context. So I love having been here and got, been able to see everyone um, here because you have such a great model of having a wonderful space for these kinds of reflections. The papers this morning were really great. I learned an enormous amount by listening to them. So that's what we do in bioethics. We try and open up this moral space for reflection, but then at the same time, we have to pay attention to the broader context, such as the market, how market logic shapes cultures of research and care, and we also have to be aware of the structural forces shaping individual actors and decisions. So what I'm urging you to do, back to the original question, is think hard when the conversation defaults to choice and think of my talk and maybe worry a little bit about how choice is not the only uh, solution to a, a problem. Sometimes it seems like it is. Thanks. And that's my armor in case anyone wants to attack. So we have, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Is someone going to moderate for me or should I? We have someone circulating. Everyone is hungry. All right, back there. And then I'll go to you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Koenig. Um, I had a quick question. Um, thank you so much, first off, for your um, great talk talking about privacy and choice. And I was just wondering um, if you have any thoughts on if there's any generational differences between big data sharing and choice when it comes to advertising and even healthcare. Yeah. And kind of, you know, especially for people in my generation, I don't think many of us batted an eye at the fact that our data is being sold and our digital footprints being sold constantly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering if you could potentially give some th thoughts about that. And then secondarily, um, I was wondering if you could comment on individual branding for physicians. So there are some physicians that are on Twitter, Instagram, trying to sell their individual brand. Really, two really interesting questions. I've already confessed to being a, a digital dinosaur, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually not that bad. Um, I was a very early adapter, and I actually have a, a picture of myself in my home office working on my thesis with an old... Um, 300 baud modem that you used to put the old-fashioned telephone and put it in so that you could connect into the computer center. Some of some people remember that era. Um, so I'm not that bad. Um, I actually don't buy that argument that the young aren't concerned about their privacy. Um, I think if they aren't, I think they should be. I think they should especially be concerned about the issue of its uses. Now, you may not... Um, yeah, so so I'm going to be pretty draconian about that because I think whether people, and I don't know the research on that, maybe someone else knows it, but I think my understanding is that it's starting to turn around, that that was the case that about five years ago that people seem to have a different sense of personal boundaries and, and privacy um, and that that has started to turn around a little bit. Um, someone is nodding, so maybe... Maybe I'm getting that right. Um, on the question of personal brands for physicians, um, I think we use that kind of market language at our peril. Um, and I think it's directly counter to professionalism. And I think I, I, would be, uh, I would be concerned. That doesn't mean that the intent of explaining your uh, what differentiates you from others um, I, I know you recently had a big debate, a set of debate about uh, boutique practices. Is that where that is that where that question comes from? Yeah. Um, you know, I also Victoria Sweet, who I just gave you that wonderful quote from, also argues that in some cases boutique practice is a good thing because it allows uh, for the kind of slow medicine practice that she wants, and she really is. You know, one of the big problems that we're having in medicine is, uh, you know, the moral distress that we're dealing with in <coughs> clinicians like, oh, I just meet with all my pediatric intensivists and, uh, at UCSF, and people are so concerned, uh, you know, have so many concerns, hospitalists, et cetera, um, that, you know, providing a way of allowing people to practice in a way that's commensurate with their, what they feel they can, can do is ha that's the good side of the boutique medicine. But maybe there's a way, we, maybe we can just take a pledge to not call it brand. I don't know. <laughs> maybe I'm the only one who's concerned. But hope, but I am. I down in front. Thank you for an excellent talk. The talks this morning and your talk made me think about a way to sort of reframe all of this because it's not so much about the increasingly sterile informed consent as it is about finding out what patients are interested in, what their values are, and then spending the time, and I understand the problem of yeah. time, yeah. Um, yeah. in talking to them in a way that is meaningful for them. Would, would that be another way to think about this instead of brands and marketing? Absolutely, although I, I have a deep concern based on my decades of research on care near the end of life that, that I would say my one critique of the modern palliative care movement, and I was a, a George Soros faculty scholar in the Project on Death in America, so was part of that whole effort to create the, um, to create hospital, to legitimize, to create and legitimize hospital-based palliative care as a specialty. So I'm totally uh, in favor of it. I think th one of the concerns is that because of branding issues, they don't want to be associated with death. They don't want to talk about death. They want to pretend that they're not, and that's problematic. Um, and so now I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, which is 
happens to people who are becoming digital dinosaurs. Um, but hopefully the other half. Uh, tell me your, your question again. Oh, the... The, the, the notion yeah. of actually not thinking about the, the, the sterile informed choice. I'm going to oh, tell yeah, you yeah. ten things, and you're going to say yes or no. Yeah. But I'm going oh, to. Oh, yeah. Now I remember. Yeah. yeah. So the other. So the two problems with palliative care. Uh, one I mentioned. Then the other is that they all almost have turned communication into a magic technology. That if you do it just right, if you have the conversation just right, then it'll come to the right outcome. And I. <clears throat> I don't think that's necessarily the case. I don't think technology should be, I don't think communication should be sort of made into an instrumental. I think it's, it, that's, not, that's not a way to have a fundamentally uh, open, fully, uh, you know, relationship based on hopefully shared decision making that's good. So, so but, but, but yeah, go ahead. How do you find out what the patient is interested in? in, in well, I don't want a script. That's what I'm saying. I don't want to. I don't want a script yeah. like yeah. You, here. And maybe you need to give it to early learners. You know, here, try these three sentences. Um, but I find that a little creepy. So I always have. I'm sorry. And then Susan after that. Yeah. You're first. Um, so I think to, to Ed's point. I mean, I, I guess as I get older and older, I think that I'm amazed that we can't ever seem to, on anything, live sort of in the center of a pendulum, right? Yeah. We're, we, we've always got to be on one extreme or another. Mm -hmm. And so we, we've, you know, gone through the era of deciding for people what's best for them and gone to the era of fetishes for choice that aren't necessarily even really choices. Yeah. And yeah. economics has learned over many years that people are not, I mean, the problem with the marketplace is that people are rotten consumers, and yep. it's the caveat emptor sort of notion of choice um, that, that causes the problems. So isn't our job in healthcare at least, and maybe in other things, as professionals to help people make good choices? I mean, is, I think that's what you were getting at, <laughs> isn't it? Um, oh, it, I, I think that's what I was trying to say, too. As, yeah. Well, I, but I yeah. think you were... You don't know what it is. I, yeah, yeah. But if you don't ask, if, if there's no choice, if you, re, if you remove choice and you remove the marketplace, yeah. that doesn't help you make good choices. I guess what I'm doing, I'm making an argument for having more defaults in, in, in for example, end-of-life care, um, and that those defaults could be informed by a, a complicated, by, by an excellent deliberative process that might help establish some community standards and then there will be people who want to opt out of that, and you'll find out via communication. But I, I, I just am, I was, in the, in the decades that I spent working on this, I was, I just thought we had the defaults wrong. You know, the, and the best defaults, you know, we, we DNR everybody. Was that a good default? Well, no, we haven't really thought through that. I mean, that was probably never a good default. Um, and so where, where, how should we, how can we do that? So does that make sense? Or you want more? In, well, and I think also we're just by definition we are individually focused. We don't. Um, you only have if you're a clinician, you have the patient in front of you. So of course, yes, you that's that's you have to communicate with that person, and I, um, and I want that communication to be as robust and as um, as respectful as possible. Susan, yeah, just to comment on that, you know, I think. As a profession, we haven't always done the greatest job of training people to be respectful and good mm -hmm. listeners. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and some of our papers this morning uh, actually showed that. So, um, but my question is, now I know why you were so excited about my rant in the Hastings Center report yeah. about skin in the game yeah. and other market metaphors. Yeah. Um, Applied to a different area, not big data or end of life decision making, but an even more sort of consumerist notion mm -hmm. of choosing providers, choosing insurers, choosing, you know, rating quality and looking at that and making sure prices and quality and everything's transparent because as soon as you're having substernal chest pain and being rushed to the ER, you're going to first stop and check your Yelp. Yeah, yeah. not exactly. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah. So, but I, I do think that there are times when we can encourage patients, not just consumers, to be, you know, uh, uh, 
trusting wisely by looking into some things before yeah. they seek care at certain places or spend a certain amount of money, whether it's theirs or somebody else's. So I just wonder if some of the lessons you've learned about choice and consent in research, where consent certainly can't carry the moral weight we've tried to give it, and end of life, um, could apply also to the market for our healthcare system, which is problematic and totally flawed. Ooh, if I had the answer to that, I would be, I, I'd be able to buy, start a company and do, be a consultant and make a lot of money. Um, you know, I think I'm going to be trying to do this a little bit in this process at, um, across the University of California system to, to think of how we should collaborate about big data projects. Um, uh, but, but I think, but that's, and the other thing that's happening today is that the traditional regulatory breakdown between what's clinical care and what's research is just out the window because it's not gonna, it doesn't work at all in this environment as a, as a, as a bright line rule. Um, and so I, I honestly don't know if there are any good models for how health systems are having those conversations with their, um, with their patients. Maybe Geisinger, Geisinger did do it to some extent. I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe someone else. We've got a lot of other people in the room who know a lot about this. Scott may know something, uh, you know, about that. But um, push me more. Did I answer your question? Okay. I'll push you tomorrow. Okay. Right here. Um. I have a perspective that's a little bit different because I don't deal in the systems. If you're a, a digital dinosaur, I'm your predecessor. Okay. okay. Um, and I'm a retired minister, and I, have, I view this from the perspective of individual persons, not so much from systems. One of the things that I observed in some of the people that I worked with in my congregations and that I have attempted to do in myself, number one, have conversations with family and close friends and your primary care physician so that they understand where you stand on things, how you confront some of these issues of health, particularly issues of dying. Yep. And where people have done that, they have had successful times in the dying process. I, I have a, a primary care physician. I just secured her about 15 months ago because I sensed that she was a person who listened. When I go to see her, as I've seen her four times in the last year, we essentially hold conversations, and we talk about her perspective on issues of medicine and my perspectives. Once I had, not her, but another doctor go with me when I was having a diagnosis of cancer, and I felt sure that would, what the diagnosis would be, and I felt I wouldn't understand it, that my emotions would be so wrought up, I wouldn't get it. So this doctor came and helped me to grasp what was going on so that I understood better. And I think if you come to the end of your life and you have a physician who will be with you to help you in that shared decision making by helping you to understand, knowing, knowing you, knowing your background, and I don't know how to change the American medical system to bring that about, but that, it seems to me, offers more genuine hope to protect the right of a person to make choices and at the same time not to be, not to do bad things to the system as, as a whole. Well, after that, we'll I'm going to let that comment stand. Okay. Uh, right over here in the blue It seems like you're uh, getting at um, community systems uh, as one solution. And I'm wondering what you think of uh, the value or lack of value of public education in informing people about choices regarding uh, near end of death or enrollment in uh, large genetic databases. And here I'm thinking about uh, general communication through various uh, forms of, uh, of media or maybe uh, societal gatherings, or a referral to more specialized information? That's a great um, observation. Um, the problem is, is sort of about the volume of the 
uh, of decision making and the amount of time and energy people will put into some of these things up front. Um, so clearly we, and I, I was part of the first Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded um, effort called Last Acts, which was had specifically had the goal of trying to transform the way we talked about and thought about death in the United States. Um, a lot of money was devoted to it. My UCSF colleague Steve Schroeder was the president of the foundation at that point. Um, the Open Society Institute then tried to do more. I think, but so, so yes, we do, and we're now having much. You know, and they they hired script writers. They did the whole thing. <laughs> so yes, I think. That is a good thing. I think we need to extend some of that to some of the precision medicine. The problem with precision medicine at the moment, it's, it's all about hype. It's not, uh, it's not very seriously about what some of the barriers are going to be to actually come to actual um, good outcomes. So that's, um, I think, a little problematic. The one area that we're working on in California, and, and I know in Michigan actually is the pioneer in this, is is newborn screening, and then the the need to create newborn screening blood spots. I know there's another lawsuit here, which I need to hear about. I don't know about it. Wendy could tell me about it. Um, so, so I think maybe that's the way to start because that's something that's the sort of genetic test that everybody gets um, at birth, and that's a great way. And people are interested in children, so that might be one sort of wedge into it, and I think would be uh, useful. <laughs>